It's no secret that these M1 Pro MacBooks are powerful, but are they $5,000 Windows editing PC powerful? In this video, I'm going to attempt to replace my really beefy RTX 3080 editing PC with the entry-level M1 Pro MacBook. And I'm gonna be taking you through my editing and workflow process to produce all the videos you see on this channel. Also, big thanks to Salad for sponsoring this video, but more on that later. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why would I make such a video? Well, it's pretty simple. I'm looking at switching up from a desktop-based computer to a laptop system. Up until now, I haven't really found anything that's powerful, quiet, and portable enough for use. I wanna be able to take this machine to and from an office and have it render things, run the entire business and YouTube channel from it, all on one computer, instead of switching between a laptop and a desktop computer. I want everything in one place. So let's quickly talk about the PC specs first. So like I mentioned previously, I have an RTX 3080. The CPU is a Ryzen 3900X. There's no kind of overclocking, although I do have a 240 mil radiator with four fans cooling the CPU. And it's also got 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM. One thing to mention with building your own custom PC and just building PCs in general these days is there's a massive parts shortage, especially in certain parts of the world. So for me in Australia, to even get my hands on a 3080 after wait weeks and weeks and weeks, I have to pay a small fortune to get it as well because of obviously the silicon shortage. And you just don't really have that issue with laptops at the moment. Yes, there is a restricted amount of laptops being sold, due to the shortage, but at least with Apple devices, the prices don't increase, the prices stay the same. So there's that to consider as well. Not saying that you shouldn't buy custom PCs, I'm just saying that right now, sometimes it can be a lot easier for someone like myself, who just needs something ready to go right out of the box to pick up a laptop. Now, moving on to cameras and what kind of camera setup I have in the studio. This particular timeline I'm about to show you has three different cameras and three different angles. So this top-down shot is a Sony A7 Mark III shooting in 4K. I'll also put up the exact codec and everything up on the screen so you can see it. The camera you're seeing me on right now is a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. It's the 6K version. I am recording my talking head segments in B-RAW, which is obviously a RAW codec. And then I've also got a third camera for longer videos that I have off to the side as kind of like an extra angle. That is a Sony A7S Mark III. And the footage there, again, I'll put it up in the top right-hand corner, but it's 422, 10-bit, 4K. It's basically some of the highest quality 4K footage you can get. Okay, so let's open up Resolve now and we'll take a look at some of the projects that I typically do on this channel. As you can see here, we have a relatively complex one. This particular video was one I did last week. It's the Razer Blade 14 versus this machine here, the base model 14 inch M1 Pro MacBook. So zooming into the timeline, you can see we have a triple stacked timeline here. Now the very top line of footage is obviously the top down uh, shot with the Sony A7 Mark III. Uh, if we look at the one underneath that, we have the Sony A7S Mark III off to the side. Uh, that is being held by someone. It's handheld, uh, stabilized on the actual camera itself. And then the bottom layer is obviously the talking headshot. And this is in B-RAW, as you can see there, it says B-RAW. Um, so not a super complex timeline. I do have some fusion titles and some effects here as well, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, so first things first, let's just see how this scrubs and plays back. So if I just play this here, you can see it's playing back in the full 24 FPS, uh, screen recording there, playing back fine. That B-RAW playing totally fine as well. Let's come up to some Fusion titles. So a little bit laggy there with that Fusion, but you can see the text pops up totally fine. So here's actually a uh, little bit more difficult section. So all different clips playing back in real time. And that is playing back really, really well, guys. So let's come over here to a longer section. Let's do some scrubbing. So you can see that B-Raw, a little bit of dropped frames. Uh, it's not super smooth, but when I actually come to play it back, that plays back perfectly fine. Now, one thing to note is I'm actually playing this timeline back 
in 4K, which you shouldn't do on a laptop. Uh, generally, I will actually drop this down to 1080p to get the best performance. Um, so if I now do that, you can see we're getting quite a few less dropped frames, although we're still getting some dropped frames here or there, uh, which is kind of unavoidable. Um, so that works pretty good. If we come over here to some fusion text and titles, that's playing back pretty well and even scrubbing quite nicely also. One thing to mention is all of this footage is color graded. Uh, nothing too crazy, I just have some curves. I've also got some color wheels as well. I don't typically use LUTs on my footage. I like to go into the camera settings, make the colors as accurate as possible, and then just do some very light color correction in Resolve, just makes it a lot easier. And typically I like to have my timelines relatively simple, uh, nothing too crazy. Um, so this probably isn't gonna be the most accurate representation of how far you can push this machine. Everyone's timelines and editing are different. Some people have five hour long timelines. Some people do five minute videos. So it's very difficult to sort of give you an accurate understanding of how exactly this will perform. But this is just what I do on a regular basis on this channel. So hopefully you will find it helpful. Now, just before we go any further, a quick word from the sponsor of this video, Salad. Salad is a free application which allows you to earn rewards by enabling your computer to work while idle. Run Salad when you're away to score Discord Nitro, games, Visa prepaid cards, Amazon gift cards, and more. Salad will decide the most profitable task for your computer and then pay out everything you have earned. Check out the download link below and use promo code CREATED to get a sign up bonus. And if you have any questions or need some help, join the Salad Discord server. So let's have a quick look at how this Sony A7S Mark III footage performs. So again, guys, like I said, everything here is in 4K. Uh, the talking head is in 6K. Uh, with this particular top line of footage, it's a very, very compressed Sony A7S Mark III codec. As you guys already know, it's very, very difficult to not only just edit, but play back. Uh, and as you guys can see there, that is scrubbing very, very easily. Only a couple of dropped frames here and there. Uh, if I play it back now, very, very smooth. Uh, even if I go frame by frame, zero issues there at all. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to drop on one of the test clips that I use for testing these particular laptops. Uh, so again, this is Sony A7S Mark III. It is a two minute clip. And typically what I like to do is I like to stabilize this uh, and then I'll test it on other computers. And this is important because sometimes with the handheld shots off to the side, when I clip that in, they're a little bit shaky, so I have to stabilize them. Generally, I only stabilize for 30 second to one minute sections at a time. Uh, this particular clip of two minutes is just gonna give us a good idea of how this machine will perform. Okay, so I'm just gonna use the default stabilize effect. So I'm gonna start that I'm also gonna start the timer on my phone. Okay, so we're just about to finish, there we go. So that was exactly one minute to stabilize that two minute clip. What I'll do guys is I'll throw up the results from my $5,000 Windows editing PC so you can compare. And guys, that is not bad at all. One thing to mention guys is if you're using DaVinci Resolve on a PC, to gain access to being able to use the GPU to render and help playback, uh, your timeline, you actually need to upgrade to the studio version, which is 300 US dollars. On the free Mac version, hardware acceleration is enabled by default. You don't have to pay for the studio version. So that's already a 300 US dollar difference between these two platforms. But I thought I would tell you that just in case you didn't know, because it's not a very widely known fact. Now, what I'll also do is let's check out the internal temperature and how much RAM and CPU and GPU this particular timeline is using up. So in terms of temps, if I bring up TG Pro here, you can see that the GPU is actually quite cool. So again, guys, we're not rendering, uh, we're not doing any kind of uh, rendering or anything in the background. Uh, so our performance cores are sitting at barely 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, so relatively cool in terms of CPUs. GPU, almost exactly the same. You can see both clusters are sitting at about 53, 54 degrees Celsius. If we come up to Activity Monitor now, let's have a quick look at the CPU usage. As you can see, DaVinci Resolve is sitting at about 10% CPU usage, which is pretty typical. Uh, they don't typically 
Editing programs these days don't typically use up a lot of the CPU. It's mainly RAM and your GPU. So coming into the memory tab, you can see this is the base model 16 gigabyte RAM version. We're using 11 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, memory pressure is essentially non-existent. That's very, very good. And swap is barely being used at all. Only about 300 megabytes. And I've said this before guys, but I think for these type of edits, 16 gigabytes is probably your best bang for buck. Uh, I've been doing some testing with 32 gigabyte M1 Pro and M1 Max. DaVinci Resolve doesn't really seem to take advantage of all 32 gigabytes. That extra RAM is only really beneficial if you're doing other things. So you're multitasking, so you're editing, you've got Photoshop open, you know, 10 or 15 tabs. Uh, if you're doing all that kind of stuff at once, yes, maybe consider 32 gigabytes of RAM. But if you're like me and you just concentrate on doing the edit first and then maybe then focusing on Photoshop, for example, uh, I think 16 gigabytes is plenty. And as you can see right there, DaVinci Resolve only using about 7.5 gigabytes, uh, leaving us almost six gigabytes free on the system for additional multitasking. Okay, so now it's time to render out this 30 minute video. You'll be able to see on the PC that it is using the NVIDIA CUDA cores as the hardware accelerator for the render. Now the time to beat is 11 minutes and 22 seconds. That's how long it took my Windows PC to render out this particular project. So I'm gonna add this to the render queue. We're going to render that and we're gonna give it a few minutes. We're gonna come back and we're gonna see how this stacks up to and compares to the Windows PC. Okay, so the render is done and the final time was 19 minutes and 32 seconds. So compared to 11 minutes and 22 seconds on the Windows PC, there's obviously, you can't really compare the two. The Windows PC was almost twice as fast, but you guys have to understand that the RTX 3080 is an absolute beast. It sucks a lot of power, produces a lot of heat, is quite noisy as well and it's obviously a desktop graphics card. So for this base model M1 MacBook to do it in 19 minutes is still a pretty good result, especially because this machine does not need to be connected to a power source. I can have it anywhere on my lap, on a table, on the bed, literally anywhere, getting the same performance. And the other thing to mention is I don't typically do videos this long, so half an hour videos uh, something I've only recently done on the channel. Typically my videos are only about eight to 12 minutes long. So the render time is gonna be halved and that means that there'll still be a big difference between the two, but it's only gonna be maybe three or four minutes maximum. So I think all in all, that is a pretty good result and it means that I definitely can replace my big $5,000 Windows editing PC with this machine. And I think the only drawback that I'm going to get is I'll just have to leave it rendering a little bit longer than what I did on the Windows PC. Anyway guys, hopefully you found this video interesting. I really came into this video not expecting how this machine would perform, but now that I know that I can literally move my entire editing workflow over to this machine with very minimal performance differences, I think I'm actually going to do it. Like I said, I need to switch my workflow from a desktop to a laptop in order to be able to move between an office and obviously my home to do editing and content production. So I think this machine, possibly the max version is gonna be the one that I end up going for. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. Any comments or questions, you know what to do. But apart from that, I'll catch you in the next one.